Let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to John 18 and hold it there, please. John 18. We're going to go, go to the cross today and look at some pictures of the cross. I hope it will be a real challenge uh, to you there. I want to read through some of the scriptures here today. Would you stand with me, please? Some of the basic scriptures, and then we will come back to different sections of the scripture. Now, this is where Jesus is before Pilate. We pick up the story, John 18, 36, and following. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness Unto the truth, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But you have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Chapter 19. we read a few verses here. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto to them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. And the chief priests therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. May God bless his word, and we'll continue on in his word as we come to the parts of the message. I've entitled the message, Only Nine Hours to Live. Let me ask you, if you received a call this morning at 6 o'clock, 6 a.m., and said, Don... Chad, Paul, whatever your name is, you have only nine hours to live. At three o'clock in the afternoon, you'll breathe your last. What would you think? And what would you do? We're going to walk with the Savior, Jesus, on that final day. We're going to observe some real scenes of his suffering. And I pray when you leave today that you'll get a little glimpse of the agony, the suffering, the pain that Jesus experienced for you and for me. Before the cross, on the way to the cross, and at the cross. Our first time is 6 a.m. Now, I don't know what time exactly except for a few places in the Scripture. said the third hour and the sixth hour or the ninth hour. You see, we know that basically. But the other... You just have to imagine the time, and I want you to get a kind of a glimpse, maybe, of what was going on. We said we came before Pilate. Jesus is taken to Pilate. Now, this is after, this is on the Friday morning. 
John 18, 33 through 38, we read some of those verses. He's discussing with Pilate about his kingship and the kingdom. For three years, Jesus had showed God's kingdom, God's rule, God's reign, who he was and who God really is. And showed them that, that they needed God's rule in their hearts. He was not an earthly king as such. He wasn't like a David on a throne. He didn't come as a David Messiah. He came as God's Messiah, the anointed one of God. He didn't come like Pilate to take Pilate's place. Jesus said, if you'll notice these words in verse 36, my kingdom is where? Not of this world. So what kind of kingdom is it? It's an everlasting kingdom. It's God's kingdom. It's spiritual kingdom. He came from the Father to point Jews and Gentiles to God's kingdom. He's God's king, God's Messiah who's going to rule and reign forever. So his mission was to bear truth of who God is and who he was. What did Pilate ask in verse 38? You have to answer that question yourself. Did you know that? Every person has to answer it. What is truth? And until you come to know Jesus, he is the living truth. Truth became a person. There is the difference in the world's view of truth and God's view of truth. We have the written truth in the Word of God, but we have the living truth in the person the Son, the living Son of God. And truth, he could have told a Pilate right there, Pilate, truth stands right before you. He didn't say that, but he was. Correct? Jesus, the living truth, stood right before him when he asked that question. He stands before you and me today. And you ask what is truth, you can see him. Secondly, we move to the time 6.30. Uh, this is what we call the scourging, the beating. Look in verse 1 of chapter 19. They, they were going to release to them on the Passover a criminal. So now Pilate's going to try to get out. He's got, uh, he's got Jesus and he's got a Barabbas. And they said, Barabbas was an overwhelming answer. Release it. Chapter 19, 1. Pilate, therefore, took Jesus and scourged him. Now, this looks like something maybe like a scourging whip, a beating whip, maybe one to two feet long. He has leather straps. You got to see pieces here, bone, some metal pieces. I don't know all the kinds of pieces that were on some of the, the Roman. They call him the lictor. The Roman soldier was named the lictor who used the scourging whip. Now you've got a picture. Out here is a stake, just like a stake in the ground, maybe a pole. And the, soul, uh, the criminal is tied to that stake and he's bent over or laying back on the, toward the ground. And so he stands back, whatever distance is, is to swing far, six feet, seven feet, whatever. You just picture that in your mind. And these pieces of metal and bone, when he hits, it hits the back of Jesus. And Jesus' back begins to split. Blood is pouring. The rich red blood of the Savior. Sometimes they said even... People, when they were scourged, the ribs would open on the sides when they pulled and jerked the scourging whip. Other parts of the body, nerves, tendons. We don't know all the things that happened, but you get a picture of this hitting your body and the body of our dear Savior. Sometimes they said when they 
whip those slashes upon the back is the sound of a dull drum. That's every time it cut into his body. And all the while they're laughing. This becomes a happy performance for the soldier. But now it stops. Jesus' head is dropped, breath is failing, lungs collapsing. His eyes are closing, probably going unconscious. Sometimes they said they were sent for claws and cold water and touched the body, but that was only made it worse. Greater agony and suffering. So the clock continues, 730. Verse 2 of chapter 19 says the soldiers played it a what? Crown of thorns. Soldiers playing a trick on Jesus. I asked that no young people come up here, especially little ones. If they come by and touch this, somebody may feel some very bad pricks. Now, this was made by a precious lady. She was, a, I remember her well, a tall lady. She had long fingers. And um, she fixed it in her yard, in her house. And as she said, it, it cut her fingers. She put gloves of all kinds. Leather gloves, whatever. These like basically locust branches. And, uh, but anyway, it just gives you a real picture of the crown of thorns. And it says they, they put it on Jesus' head. I'm sure they, they knocked it with a pole. Pressed it down. Just think of the thorns going into the brow or to your head. And everywhere it touched, the blood spurt. The rich red blood of Jesus. The soldiers, they had no sympathy. The sharp thorns penetrated our wonderful Savior's head and brow. They said, oh, you're a king, huh? You got the crown like a king. Now let's put the purple robe on you. What about the purple robe? Purple has poisonous dye in it. Did you know that? So when they threw that upon Jesus, the dye goes into the bloodstream, into his body. He's a great king, great person of distinction. But the poison mixes with the blood down Jesus' back and shoulders. Pain is unbearable. They mock him, slap him, beat him. The crown of thorns and the robes. Now let's move along to 8. We picture 8 a.m. Pilate and the crowds. He brings Jesus back. I mean, we read that. Verse 4, verse 5. Pilate said, Behold the man. Chief priests, officers, others said, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. The shouts and the screams of the religious leaders, the crowds, echo through the yard. Crucify him. Crucify him. The Bible says in verse 6 that they gave in. Pilate gives in, delivers Jesus to be crucified. The clock is moving, 8.30 now. You look to the cross beam and the Via Dolorosa. Now the even soldiers grab Jesus and they strap the cross beam across his back. Of his bleeding, sliced back. Jesus is proud to probably become unconscious again. He, in and out, I'm sure. But there he goes, carrying that cross, stumbling under the heavy load. 
A great story is told in, of Simon Serene in Luke's Gospel, the Gospel of Luke, Luke 23. You can read about it. it speaks of Simon of Serene or Serene. He jerked from the crowd, made to pick up the cross and carry it for Jesus the rest of the way. Now, the Via Dolorosa, that word is a path or the road of suffering that Jesus walked after they scourged him and made his way to Calvary. Think of the wood for a moment. This cross beam and the cross upon which Jesus hung. Chopped, splintered tree. You think, you think it was fine like this piece of wood's here? I don't think so. I think they made it just as tough for criminals and people to be crucified as they could. It just chopped and splintered, rough and rugged, heavy, just cruel. Not smooth or polished. So the soldiers step it up. They move him. Move on, great king. They mock him, shout at him. Soldiers pop the whips at different times. And on that long road to Calvary, he makes it. In the immense pain, indescribable thirst, in and out of consciousness, breathing, bleeding. And now he arrives at the heel of the cross. It's nine now. We're there at Calvary. In John 19, hear these words, beginning in verse 18. Where they crucified him, verse 18, and two other with him. <clears throat> on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. In the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified. It was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Just think of Jesus lying with his arms open wide. He's on the ground and they made it. And now he's outstretched and what do the soldiers do? They nail him. Nail him to the cross. I don't know the sizes of the nails. Here's a mighty long nail. Here is a bigger nail. How would you like to have that driven in your hands and your feet? That's what it was. The agony, the suffering. Jesus is hanging now and they drop him in the hole prepared on the hillside. Mark 15 says that third hour, that would be 9 a.m., they began to crucify him. We read in John here, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is, is the title given on the placard above his head. It's supposed to be the crime if what a criminal does is right above his head. Written out. Why in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so all the people there could read it? And there are different kinds of people could speak different languages. Could pass by and see the wonderful Savior. He died for the world. He died for Americans. He died for Chinese. He died for the world. But has he died for you? Have you accepted the death of Christ at the cross? The clock continues. It's 10 now. 10. Look down with me to verse 23 and 24. Then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and 
made four parts. To every soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. But they said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, they parted my raiment among them and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. I don't know. I brought some dice. Some of the historians say they didn't roll dice. They rolled colored stones most likely. You just picture a little stone with a different color on it and they decided if you chose red or if I chose black or blue or whatever, that would be the piece where it rolls over. So that was a picture. Gambling at the cross for the pieces of clothing of Jesus. This is mine. No, this is mine. I want that part. The centurion says, you gamble for it and cast the lots. And they called their color and picked up their piece and went back to their duties. The clock moves forward now, 11 a.m. We see many others there at the cross. We don't know how many people are in Jerusalem for Passover. Uh, many were coming from different areas and knew about the God of Israel and wanted to follow the Passover in Jerusalem. Now many were going to the hill of Calvary to see one named Jesus. Walking, sneering, mocking, wagging their heads. We've seen some of the Gospels. They didn't think any more about Jesus than you would just any old criminal, a hated criminal of the city. The religious leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees, the priests, scribes, they're hollering and mocking and making their outburst. Even the criminals at the cross, one on the left, one on the right, one is railing, mocking. Get us down from here. In Luke's gospel we read two weeks ago, Luke 23. The one's heart is breaking. We call him the repentant thief. He rebukes his criminal friend said, Don't you know that we need to be here? We are under this judgment, this condemnation, because we deserve it. But not this just one. Not this Jesus. This one in the center. And he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into the kingdom. And Jesus said, today, today shall be with me in paradise. He recognized his sin. The Spirit of God moved in his heart. To look at Jesus. Death was knocking. The breath was failing. The hour for eternity was near. Maybe you need to think about that. This morning. Who knows. I could not be standing here this morning. But by the grace and mercy of God. Just a. Just think. Just. Just a couple of feet. How do I know? How do you know if Martha and I both could have been killed quickly? But he didn't. Eternity. The door is knocking. Quickly. These guys at the cross, one realized it. He knew it. And he turned to Christ. Now it's high noon. It's, the clock is, said the midday hour at 12. God the Father has 
cause all creation to bow. The sun is hidden. Dark clouds have come into the heavens. What is this? This darkness. I think it's Mark's gospel. Shares about that. The last three hours. From 12 to 3. Darkness covers the land. Could it be that the sin of the world has been revealed, has made known? You may say the dark black stain of humanity in our sin has been poured out upon Jesus. And the Father says, let the heavens declare it. The darkness. There at the middle cross, Jesus has taken it all in. Upon his own body at that tree. You ever share when you shared the faith of Jesus? That he's taken your place in mine. He's taken your darkness in my darkness. That's what sin does. It separates, it breaks the heart of God. We're disobedient, rebellious people. Is poured out upon Jesus. The grace of God given for us. The clock continues to tick. It's one now. Look in verses 25 through 27. John 19, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his Mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. Mother. Let me ask you, mothers here, what if you were standing at the cross and looking up and there was your son? What would you think? What would be going through your mind and heart? Hear the words of the dying Savior. These are some other words here of Jesus' last words. Behold your mother Woman, behold your son. The clock moves to two. Verses 28 and 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. I thirst. There was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. We let this realize that hyssop was like a, a plant in that period of time. A special plant. It had like a stalk, a reed here. We have the sponge dipped in there and he shot it up to Jesus to touch his lips, parched lips. It dripped down from his face. rolling down his beard and the soldiers shrug and throw aside and sit down. They said on the sponge is like a jar of Pasca, P-O-S-C-A. It's an ordinary drink of soldiers. Sour wine, water, beaten eggs would turn into vinegar quickly. And this is what they put to his face and to his mouth. The clock moves to three. Jesus' earthly journey is completed. John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What did Jesus mean? Was he defeated? Was it over? 
No. He won an amazing victory. Victory over the penalty of sin and the power of sin. Dear ones, today, all of us have sinned, born with a sin nature. Original sin. We've talked in Romans about Adam and Eve. You can't get away from it. You can do all you want to try to get rid of sin. Do what you think is the best thing. Be righteous in your own self. You can't do it. Jesus paid it all. He paid the price. The penalty was taken upon in him by Jesus. And he wants to live powerfully in your life. That you can overcome sin in your life. Surely we fail him. But he took our disobedience. We miss God's perfect mark. We can't measure to his standard. But his, he was a substitute. He took our judgment. Nailed it to the cross. He won the battle. That's part of it is finished. It is finished also is not hopeless words, but glorious hope. People search to be right with God. Holy God, unholy man. We tried to get rid of sin ourselves. We still live in the eye life. King I. S-I-N. It won't work. Say, I'll obey this law. I'll do this. I'll peace. Whatever God I want, I'll have a certain religion. It won't work. Jesus hung between heaven and earth and he opened the way back to God so we could be in a right relationship to him. We can know God personally. Ephesians 2, 12 and following, at that time without Christ, we have no hope. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off, are made nigh, near by the blood of Christ. It's not you. It's the blood of Christ who can bring us back to Him. It's not darkness. When He said it is finished, it's true light. The devil and all the forces of evil heard these words. It is finished. They just knew. They're jumping for joy that Jesus is dead. He's breathed his last breath here on this earth. But Jesus' light never goes out. It's the true light, everlasting light. Darkness of sin cannot prevail. It's not death, but wonderful life. Death has been defeated. He broke the chains of death, hell and the grave. That third day at the tomb, he arose. He came out bodily resurrected as the living Lord. He made it possible for all to have eternal life today and tomorrow and forever. With his arms open wide, with his arms open wide, Jesus came. For us, with his arms open wide. Look at the cross outstretched for you and me. Twenty centuries have passed. And the cross still stands. This is only a symbol. But the real cross of Jesus, it, doesn't, it never ends. It doesn't end. Have you come to the cross? That's, that's the only thing that can change lives. The blood of Christ. In Matthew 27, Pilate said, What will I do then with Jesus? He's called the Christ. What am I going to do with him? What are you going to do with him? 
Dear ones, a call goes out today to the unsaved. You use the word lost, undone, separated from God. Living your own way. Having your own religion. You have to realize your sinfulness. That we, born in sin and desire to sin and rebel against God, He calls us to repent, turn, turn. Which way are you turning today? Your way or by the way of the cross? Which way are you turning? To who do you believe? Jesus said of himself the very first words in Mark 1.15, Repent and believe the gospel. Have you come to Christ? You may need to come to Christ. He's calling out. Pray the Spirit of God will move in your soul. He try to help you, point you to Him. Come to the Savior. He loves you and He gave His all for you. On church, you don't have a church home. Maybe you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord. You've already been baptized. Believers baptized. You believed and then were baptized to show forth you following Jesus. You need to come into His body, His church. He's the head of the body. Jesus is Lord. Christian, have you examined your life? The call of Jesus upon your life. Are you walking with Him? Do you trust Him and love Him? Living for Him? I pray that you will. Let's all stand together. Lord, Holy Spirit invites you to come. He's working in your heart now, convicting and challenging you.